we just thank you for Andy, who's going to break open the Word of God this morning, be with our children and our young people's ministry. God, we pray this will be the start of a great thing. Lord, all things are old or past, and behold, all things are new. So we're just so thankful, God, our music ministry that we want to invest in, and we've got uh, microphones, and just, Lord, uh, all kind of things we can do. So let everything we do as we begin to meet here be to your praise and to your glory. And we ask your blessing upon this morning, this new, as we begin our first Sunday school, our first Bible study, God, just be with us. Bless Andy. And, and uh, may everything be done to your glory, to the glory of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad that everybody uh, was able to make it this morning, and I guess we'll get started, but I just wanted to uh, thank everybody, and I appreciate the prayers this week. I had a, a job interview in Charlottesville for a, a management position for Food Line, and I just appreciate the prayers, and uh, I know that God was working this week, and I just pray I get a a call back, but I just know wherever I am that I can count on this congregation of Christ. They're dependable people, and they're full of love and joy, and I'm just glad to be a part of this church and the kingdom of God. But I've been spending a lot of time in prayer, and I've been spending a lot of time in prayer for this message, and um, there's just some things that God had put on my heart to, to tell you guys this morning, and I don't really want to teach this morning. I kind of want to come in here with a bang, uh, not the, a bang of like the, everyone thinks that happened at the beginning of the world, but uh, there's going to be a big bang uh, at the end of the world, that's for sure, when Christ comes back, but I just want to come in with a bang, and I, I kind of want to preach to you this morning, and if you guys don't mind, and if Pete was here, I'd say... Uh, no rude interruptions, but Pete's not here, so I can't pick on Pete. But I want to talk about long-haul Christianity. Uh, this Friday, it would be my four-year anniversary of being in the faith, and um, it's been a quite awesome ride for four years, and it's a season that uh, I pray that, that God can have me go through another season of walking with Him, but it's long-haul Christianity and what grinds my gears, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. And there, there's just things that I've realized that I look at through the world. And there's things that uh, I'm not pleased with when I look at the world. And, of course, we know the world's full of sin. And the world's not the kingdom of God. But the, the world is unrighteous and it's unfruitful. But we have to realize that something that grinds my gears is that those who don't, who don't preach in the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, it was stated of them, speaking of the apostles, that these men have upset the world. Why? Why did they upset the world? It's because they were proclaiming something that nobody believed in. They were proclaiming something that nobody had faith in. And that was the name of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We know that the Apostle Peter and Apostle John said, no, we're not going to stop preaching in this name. In Acts chapter 4, when uh, the centurion and the council were asking them, telling Peter and John that you can't be proclaiming this name. And they said, we're not going to stop preaching in this name. Because they said there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You know, I started this, uh, this diet and at work, and I've got a lot of other people who've been following me on this diet. And, you know, I was like, man, if I can influence people on a diet, why I just can't get them to follow Jesus. And that was a big conviction of mine, and it brought me to tears because... People will follow worldly things, but when you bring up the counsel of God, they're just, they're just void to it. 
And that's what bothers me is that when we preach Jesus, people have their ears shut up. Just like those when, when Stephen was preaching Jesus, him crucified, and, and was speaking to the Jews, they stopped up their ears and they stoned him. But Stephen cried out, Father, forgive them. Just as Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do, and the world doesn't know what they're doing when they reject the gospel of Christ. Another thing that bothers me is those who don't pray. You know, in Romans 12, 12, Paul says we are devoted to prayer. Before the church began in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 1, they were up in the, in the room and they were in the attic and they were in the upper room and they were devoting themselves to prayer. Not just prayer, but unceasing prayer. And maybe that's why our nation is in such a, a turn spin because there is no prayer being offered to God. I was reading a, a prayer that was given at West Point by one of the cadets there, and it said, he was praying to the Lord, he says, make us choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong, and to never be contented with half-truth when whole truth can be won. Endow us with courage that is born of loyalty to all that is noble and worthy, that scorns to compromise with vice and injustice, and knows no fear when right and truth or in jeopardy. And I said, you know, that's a good prayer because we live in a world where uh, people don't believe in absolute truth. And we have the truth of the gospel and we can either have the whole truth preached or no truth at all. And, and that's a great prayer that we have to have the whole truth being presented uh, to this world. But another thing uh, that's been bothering me is people that are complaining, complainers, and I think of the uh, Old Testament Israelites, those who complained against God and, and Moses and Numbers chapter 11. In verse 1 it says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that they were, were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we died, or which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides the manna before our eyes, and the manna was a, a coordinator seed, and the color thereof as the color of Belgula, and the people went about and gathered it and got, ground it in mills or beat it in a, a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when they drew, when, and when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So... They didn't understand what the manna represented. Jesus said in John chapter 6, the manna which came out of heaven was me. That flesh of mine was the manna coming out of heaven, out of heaven, and which the Old Testament Israel rejected. And then he continued to say in John 6, that manna which was my flesh, uh, my blood is, is the cup of, of the fruit of the vine. We got people today, not just Old Testament Israel, who reject the manna, but they reject the cup and the body of Jesus Christ, his blood is his blood and body. But Israel complained. They said, we would rather have the onions and leeks and melons and the cucumbers. It was so delightful in Egypt. But when God gives us free food and manna coming down from heaven, we want nothing to do with it. It doesn't taste as good. And people complain about what they put in their mouths. People complain about other things, such as he preached too long. Or he preaches over our heads. We complain and murmur and say maybe the church isn't growing the way we want it to be. But we've got to get over ourselves. And we're not going to win anybody with an attitude of complaining. We've got to stop being self-righteous as the Pharisees were in their day. And only thinking for themselves because Jesus said, on the outside your tombs may be clean, but inside they're just dead bones. And we need to start thinking of other people. You know, I just look out at the workplace and I just see people that they, they don't have God. And, and it hurts to see people going to hell. 
your own family members, you see them going to hell. But yet people would rather complain about things that don't matter. Another thing that bothers me is those who hate the brotherhood. The one who says, says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now, 1 John 2.9. You know, I can say of the four years, I've met so many people that have loved me and have nurtured me to be the man that I, I am and the man that I want to be. Such men as John and such men as Chuck and Randy and Daryl Hall and Chuck Dowdy and Frank Garinger, these men have, have really helped build my faith in the Lord. They've taught me how to minister to people, how to be a servant, how to effectively have a Bible with somebody who's never heard the Word of God. And that's why I love the brotherhood, because we're united, we're one. But he who says he's of light but yet hates his brother, he's in darkness. Another thing that bothers me is the lack of godly sorrow. You know, Paul made that very evidently clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. He's speaking of He's speaking to the church of the man who was there in, in Corinth who was having relations with his father's wife. And he told him in the first, uh, uh, the first book of, of Corinthians that you rebuked this man, that you have nothing to do with him. You excommunicate him, and if, he was challenging the church to do so. But he was saying that I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, speaking to the church, because uh, the church... Uh, had to be sorrowful altogether. And he wanted them to be sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces deaths. When you come before the Lord in, in all humility and repentance, that's a godly sorrow. But when you come on the account of the world, then your sorrowfulness isn't producing salvation, it's producing death. And we see people, they're sorry for many things. I heard a preacher who said, you know, I've had, I've witnessed to a lot of people who've had tears, but they never did anything about it. They knew they were sinful, but they never did anything about it. And that, that worldly sorrow didn't produce salvation, it produced death. Quenching the Holy Spirit, you know, we see that among us, people who quench the Holy Spirit, who aren't bearing the fruit of the Spirit. They're placing the Spirit with sin. And in and, and Genesis, God said, my Spirit will not always strive with man. The reason is because the Holy Spirit's in a wrestling match with our soul. And we can either have the soul overpower the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit and the power of God is going to overpower us. In 1 Thessalonians 5.9, it says, quench not the spirit. Or 5.19, excuse me, quench not the spirit. The spirit is working in your life to help you produce fruits, to produce endurance, to finish a race. But you can't finish the race if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't even start the race if you don't have the Holy Spirit. And there's only one way to get the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, and that's being born again of the water and spirit. You don't get it through confessing the Lord and bowing down to an altar, saying, I received Jesus in my heart. Scriptures don't teach that. But we must believe. Paul says, I only want to know one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing through faith? Well, of course we received it through faith. But there's something in application you have to have to that, and that you have to have obedience to the hearing of faith. And what's obedience produce? It produces your immersion and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. As you, There's no power in the water. The power is in what's going on in your heart. The circumcision made without hands, Colossians chapter 2. But we can't quench the Holy Spirit. And another thing that's just been driving me crazy is those who love the world and I've gotten to the point where I can't even read my Facebook news without somebody proclaiming uh, same-sex marriage or 
praising the President of the United States for bashing Christianity. And, and it's, it's just sad to see the world that we live in. And, you know, I like Tim Tebow. He may be a Baptist, but I, I like what he stands for on the football field. And, and he does, you know, he doesn't shun away from the name of Jesus. I mean, God forbid that he should. But great men do fall because he's in the spotlight. But what just grinds my gears is the fact that a man who plays for the Washington Wizards comes out and proclaims that he's a homosexual. And the media is like, bravo, bravo, bravo. But when Tim Tebow says, I believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified, the media just tells him to shut up. And I just don't understand that. I guess it's the world we live in and the world, the people that love the world. John said, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15. You know, I'm not going to yield a subjection to the world for even an hour, as Paul said to the, those in, Gal in Galatia. I'm not going to yield to subjection and the bondage of those trying to spy out my liberty. And I'm not going to yield in, to them for even an hour, and I don't care if the world hates me. I understand that what I preach isn't common to the world. I don't care if the gospel of Christ makes you hate me because the gospel of Christ is truth, and I'm just his messenger to proclaim it. But I'm not going to give in to the temptations and the philosophies of this world. If Jesus says that marriage is between a man and a woman, then marriage is between a man and a woman. If God says, unless you eat my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in yourselves, then I'm going to abide by it. If Peter says to repent and be baptized, every one of you, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to do it. And I'm so tired of the ideologies of this world. Oh, we got to love everybody. Last time I checked, Jesus is coming back with the sword. He gave your chance to love him. Four years now, I've, I've clinged to the truth, and I'm not gonna, and I'm going to continue to cling to it. And I'm not going to I'm not going to walk in the ways of the world. And if you're with me, then you're with me. But if you're against me, then you're against me. And there's a lot of people against me. You know what? I don't care, because God's truth endures forever. And I pray that when the glorious day of the Lord comes, I pray that you are with me, and that you're not with the goats, that you would be with the sheep. Because Jesus is the great shepherd and he shepherds his sheep. He's not going to shepherd the goats. And I pray that everyone would be saved and that they wouldn't be deceived. We know that Demas was a fellow worker. If you read Timothy, he was a fellow worker in the faith. But he fell away from the truth. Why? Because he loved this present world. We've got to stop letting the devil steal our joy. And sometimes I, I admit that the devil I have allowed to steal my joy in my walk with God. And then you have to come to the realization that with God all things are possible. You know, I, I'm just a dairy clerk at where I work, and I applied for a position that's twice above my pay raise. But I, and people are like, you're not going to get this job. What are you thinking? You're just 21 years old. These people are between their 30s to 40s, what are you thinking? I said, with God, all things are possible. You might not think so, but I got the Holy Spirit, and I got God leading me to the path of eternal life, and maybe you don't realize that, but with God, all things are possible, and, and I got to stop with the devil steal my joy. Regardless if I don't get this job, I got an interview. <laughs> I got an interview to proclaim something truth, and I, I told the guy in the interview, it's like, you know, I, I'm part of church leadership, and I believe that I can manage people in a, in a company. The reason is because the body is made of members, just like the church. And, each, and the body has a function. you got a hand, you got a foot, you got eyes, your ears, and noses. And they all have a function for the body. Just like people, people in the church and people in a the workplace, they have a function to perform a job. And I said, I believe that having encouragement and unison as a body that we can get a job effectively done in, in the church and, and also in the workplace. Stop letting the devil steal your joy. 
and stop letting them take you captive. You know, Paul said, uh, don't be held captive by the empty philosophies and deceits and precepts of men of this world. Speaking of not just the philosophies, but the, the precepts of men. That's why I don't belong to a denomination. I belong to the congregation of Christ. So stop letting the devil steal your joy. You know, I heard a lot of excuses why people love the world and why people don't uh, want to be Christians. One of the reasons is they just find the world more appealing. They just find the world more appealing. And I've been of the world. I know I've tasted things of the world. And you can't compare the two. The, the world is, is dying. It's, it makes you question what life really is. Are we just born here to die? Or is there another purpose? Well, the truth of the gospel, you see, you bring life. You're not living in a world of death. You have life. And when you taste of the Holy Spirit and the heavenly things, it's just un unimaginable the things that are much better than the world. It's undescribable. Another reason is people still love the world because they just can't be committed to the church. They've got other things on Sunday. They got their golf game. They got a baseball game to go to or they got bingo or something like that. Another reason people don't become Christians because I've heard the reason I'm just not ready. They're just not ready. You know, John was ready. He said, Lord, come quickly. You know, there was a long time for at least four months when I said, Lord, don't come. Lord, don't come. The things that Chuck Dowdy preached in his uh, 70 to 80 classes, I said, oh, Lord, please don't come. And there's people today who aren't ready. Maybe even in the church, people weren't ready. I pray that you are ready. I pray that I can see you in heaven, brothers and sisters. People just aren't ready, and I've realized that, yes, they're not ready. And that's the point when I start to pray for that person. I pray that uh, God would lead that person to be ready, to want to be clothed in the righteousness of God. Another thing that this nation has a problem with is bowing down to Baal. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and, and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if, ba if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let those choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. People are calling on foreign gods today. Oh, Muhammad, please come save us. Oh, Buddha, with all your wisdom and might, please enlighten us. Do you feel any more enlightenment? No. Because he can't hear you. He must have went to the bathroom. And it came about noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is good. Either he's occupied or gone aside. Or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out from them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took up twelve stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, 
to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood. So what, what's happening is that Elijah, he's testing the God of Baal, and we know that there is no other God but the God of heaven. And so Elijah called on the name of the Lord to bring fire down while Baal, while the prophets of Baal, which were 450 men. Uh, there's more people who today in, in our society, who have more prophets today, of false prophets, that is. And we've got evangelists proclaiming truth. But we know not to invoke the Lord like as they did in that day. Because the Lord, you never know what the Lord could do. But yet, they called fire from heaven, and, and nothing happened. So when Elijah called down fire, not only did it burn the sacrifice, but it killed all 450 prophets of Baal. And that's something that bothers me, is that people would rather bow down to Baal than they would bow down to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But one, there's going to be a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. It's 7,000 people, I want to join that number, who did not bow down uh, to Baal. You know, something that also bothers me is the people that have lack of faith. You know, Jesus said, why are you afraid, you men of little faith, in Matthew 8, 26? You know, I was reading in a book of Walter Scott where it was Christmas time and they were supposed to all go caroling and, and Walter's there saying, oh no, where's Walter? He wasn't, he wasn't among them and he was down in town hall and there was just a homeless man and Walter was singing. He said, put money in here. Because supposedly he had one of the greatest voices of his time. And he said, just put money in here for the man. And, you know, Walter didn't care for himself, but he cared enough for other people. And that's why I love the gospel and I love the church of Jesus Christ, because they don't care about themselves. They care for other people. And because Walter had great faith, and through Walter we had a great, a great revival shook America, the Restoration Movement. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him, and he said to him, You a little faith, why did you doubt? In Matthew chapter 14. They doubted the, uh, when they were all going to a big storm and Jesus was sleeping. I mean, Jesus is God, why do you doubt? And they said, Lord, wake up, we're all going to die. And he said, You men of little faith, why did you doubt? And he also, Peter, you know, he was walking on water. He was doing just fine. He was walking and treading on the water because he could see Jesus, but when he looked down, he started to sink because he lacked the faith. People worship the creation versus the creator. You know, we have so many homosexuals now that I don't, I couldn't even imagine what it was like in Sodom and Gomorrah. I was at the gym and one came through the locker room and good thing I was dressed, but I had a my work uh, box cutter in my pocket and he was just staring at me like Steve Martin. I know he does the, uh, the uh, Pink Panther, and he's that type of French guy. And just his mannerisms remind me of this guy just being flippant and stuff. And so I took the box cutter out, and I placed it on the, on the table or, I guess, the, the thing in front of the mirror, and I opened it. He didn't look at me anymore. So, you know, I'm just, we live in a world that's just so full of sin, and it's disgusting, and I just can't stand it. And, People worship the creation versus the creator, and, and they, ex they exchange the truth of God in Romans 1.25 for a lie. And they worship and serve, they serve the creation rather than the creator. The only thing I'm going to serve is our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and this creation, as beautiful as it is, I ain't going to worship it. I'll give God glory for it, but I'm not going to worship it. And then people start to make excuses for sin. They, that's one thing that drives me crazy. People make excuses for sin when they're appointed to do something in the church, but they don't follow through, follow through with it. I believe that should be sin. Uh, to him who knoweth to do good, but doeth not, to him it is sin. I had that conversation with a man who believes in original sin, and he believes in speaking in tongues and all this hogwash that's not biblical. 
But I hate people who make excuses for sin because they're so caught up in things that don't matter, such as their children and, and other things that aren't profitable in the kingdom of God. Yes, you should raise your children up in the admonition of the Lord, but there's priorities in the kingdom of God. You know, I was just reading an article that Chuck Daddy wrote that some parents are making their kids insecure. That in the age of multimedia, more kids are spending time on Facebook and Twitter than they are in the Word of God, and I do believe that. And they make excuses for sin. They wonder why numbers drop in the church. What? People make excuses. People deny the resurrection the resurrection in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You know, Muslims deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll get into that. I'll save that for last. The, the Muslims, they just make me mad as much as anything else. We got quitters. You know, know ye not that which Paul says that <clears throat> those who run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize to run that you may attain it? There's a lot of people trying to run a race, but they don't, no one knows how to start and nobody knows how to finish. But Paul says run in a way that you know how to, how to run and you know how to receive the prize. You know, there's a crown laid up for heaven for those, God says, who are faithful unto death. A crown of righteousness, an imperishable crown. You know, disobedience is something that a lot of people are, are having a habit with, is disobedience, and Saul disobeyed the Lord. God told Saul to destroy all the Ammonites, and, and Saul didn't. He spared the king. And what happened to Saul? Well, he was eventually, he fell upon his own sword because he didn't want to be surrounded by the very enemies that God told him to kill. So disobedience, you know, Children disobey their parents. That's why God said, children, obey your parents. Hyper cool. Be attentive to what your parents say. Disobedience is contrary to the word of God because the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5 was given to those who obeyed. If you're not obeying the gospel, then you're not living faithfully to the Lord. And disobedience leads to your eternal destruction, just as Saul Self-righteousness, you know, those who think they can be perfect and that God wasn't. Isaiah said, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Isaiah 64, verse 6. You can't come before the throne of God in your own self-righteousness. Your rags are filthy if you want to come before the Lord in your righteousness. Your righteousness will never exceed the righteousness of Jesus Christ regardless if you're clothed in him or not. His righteousness is beyond anything you can imagine. His righteousness dwells in all the, all the universe because he was the Lamb of God. He lived the perfect law. Nobody could live that law. But Jesus, born of a woman, lived the law, and he set us free from the law. And that's one thing, people who want to live under the law. You know, Alexander Campbell, I was just reading of Alexander Campbell. You know, he wanted to be united. He wanted nothing but the church of Jesus Christ to be bound upon the Bible. No creeds but Christ. Because on June 12, 1812, Alexander Campbell came, he, he came to the conclusion that immersion was made, was a mode of biblical baptism. It was a, the mode of immersion. From this, Campbell was convicted and knew that he must be immersed according to the New Testament, according to Acts chapter 2. On that day, Alexander, his father Thomas, their wives and their church members were immersed, and three church members were immersed. On that day, Alexander uh, had 13 others begin to follow the call at the Brush Run Church, which was a Baptist church and which eventually became a, a church of Christ. But even Alexander Campbell listened to the call of God. He came to the conclusion, like every one of us have to come to the conclusion of, 
that we must obey the Lord and that we can't come before the Lord in, in our own self-righteousness because the law is not profitable. The law condemned by grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And so he came to the conclusion that, oh, he preached on his first sermon uh, that he preached after his baptism was on the law. I believe it was called the law. And he upset a lot of people because the law didn't save you. It was, it was God's grace that saved you. And, and that was the, the first sermon he actually asked someone if they would come forward, if they would repent and be baptized for remission of sin and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And people did. Something else that ruins a life of a Christian is the deeds of the flesh. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Galatians chapter 5 which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, as he always, he, he, Paul has already warned him, he's going to warn him again, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The deeds of the flesh are evident. You can know and tell a man or a woman by if they live in the, in the Spirit of God or if they have the deeds of the flesh, if they're walking and carousing and things in the flesh, if they have factions among brethren. You know, Paul says, you come to a, a person who causes faction, receive them once, or you rebuke them twice, and after that, you know, have nothing to do with them. They're a factious person. And they've got, then you have the workers of iniquity, the boastful in, uh, in Psalm chapter 5, it says, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. The Lord hates those who do iniquity. And you say, how can the Lord hate somebody? He loves everybody. Jesus said, I'm serving them out. Love your, love your enemies. God was speaking to your personal enemies. You're not speaking to the enemies of the cross. Those who, who deny the power and the resurrection of Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what he's talking about. What Jesus was talking about. But God hates all who do iniquity, and people can't stand the thought that God hates somebody. God hated Esau. Why did God hate Esau? Because Esau rejected his birthright. And then when Jacob got the blessing, Esau mourned and wept in tears. People want their ears tickled. You know, the same thing with you know, God hating somebody. They want the ears tickle and think that God loves everybody. The time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. People have teachers today according to their own desires. That's why you have so many denominations. That's why you have church on 11. That has Saturday night service and they have Sunday service. Or I guess it says worship on the sign. That's why you got people that go over there behind the Holiday Inn. That's why they get so many, a thousand people there. Why? Because people heap up teachers for their own desires. You want to listen to Michael Jackson? Well, listen to Michael Jackson in these. People want their ears tickled. They don't, want, they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that you have to obey. You have to be submissive to God and to the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, they're wasting God's time. And that's something that they're wasting God's time. God's time. If you're called to do a ministry, if you're asked and you say, yes, Lord, I want to do this ministry, but yet you don't follow through, then you're wasting God's time. You're wasting everybody else's time. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is what the will of the Lord is. You know, the times are evil. You know, one of the first teachings I ever learned from, from Ryan Williams is that this world is like a vapor. You're in it one minute, the next you can be out of it. You know, just not too long ago during Hurricane Sandy, two teenage kids were, were out, out of school because of the weather, and one minute they were here, the next minute they're gone. The world is like a vapor. You can be all happy, it can be all happy, joy, and sinful, but one minute you're gone in eternity, you might not ever get to 
get to see those beloved in heaven, all the saints of God, but you'd be dying in your, you would die in your sins. And that's the greatest tragedy of all tragedies is that the sins that you commit to die in those sins. So don't waste God's time. Because with wasting God's time, you're, you're rebelling against God. And rebellion is, is, the, is evil when it dwells in the heart of man. An evil man seeks only rebellion, and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Proverbs 17, 11. So an evil man only seeks rebellion. Those in Washington, D.C. only seek rebellion. They're evil men. But God's going to send a messenger against them. Those who are spiritually dead. You know, Jesus even had to address this subject in Revelation chapter 3. He said, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. You know, God was calling that church to wake up. You say you're alive, but I tell you this, that you're dead. I can say this, but our church, we're not dead. We're certainly alive. But there's a lot of churches who have fallen into the hands of the devil, who have fallen into his craftiness, who are dead, who are spiritually dead. And Jesus even had to warn some of these churches, unless you repent, I will remove your lampstand of your church, of your congregation. Jesus controls. He has the power and the authority to give and take away. And he says, I have found your deeds completed. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. So, again, you're judged by your deeds. You're judged by your works that you do in the kingdom of God. If you're wasting his time, if you're rebelling against him, and if you are spiritually dead then you're, and your deeds aren't complete, then you're dead in the sight of God. I want to conclude with this thought in religion. You know, I, I don't like religion. I believe in the taking care of widows and orphans, true, pure, undefiled religion, that's your religion, as James said. But I don't know who made this statement, but it's a good statement more, nonetheless. I would not give much for religion unless it can be seen. Lamps do not talk, but they shine. And Jesus said that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And you and I are that city. We are that light shining in the darkness. That people may see our good works. They don't talk. And the whole Islam, oh, we got to love them. We got to love the Muslims. We got to love them because, you know, Jesus said to love them. I, I've never seen so many people die, be murdered because of religion. I don't see Christians going out murdering people in the name of Jesus Christ. I see them winning people to Jesus Christ, not murdering them. And you know, how many more deaths does it have to take for us to realize that Islam is not religion? That it's just an act of evil. You know, 3,000 people died on 9-11. Two people died on April uh, 15th, 2013. How many more people have to die for us to see that this isn't religion? It's just mass murder. On Tuesday morning, April 16th, they came one after another, leaving bouquets, balloons, and stuffed animals on the front porch of the empty house. More than a thousand gathered with candles at Dorchester Playground in the evening. And on the internet, prayers and expressions of the grief came from the world for eight-year-old Martin Richard, killed in an instant. The same instant his mother and sister were severely injured. And the frantic social media traffic that followed the marathon, the Boston bombings, a photograph of the wide-eyed boy holding a sign, a hand letter sign that said, No more hurting people. Peace. This became the international emblem of the day's horror. You know, if only our governmental leaders understood what happens when you tolerate evil. This boy was innocent. He didn't know what happens when evil's in the world. He said, No more hurting people. Peace. 
teachers and students want you to advocate peace. Who solely believe if you tolerate other religions that peace will come. If only they could have their eyes open to the result of the tolerance of evil. And this is what happens. When you tolerate evil, evil will prevail. It was the third day, the first day of the week, when John and Peter were racing to the tomb. John outlegs Peter to the tomb. And now I'm sure it was a joyous occasion for John and Peter to race to the to the tomb, but Peter joins John at the tomb and it's empty. Jesus has risen on the third day like he said he would. It's the third, it's the third day, the first day of the week. John and Peter are racing to the tomb. John outlegs Peter. Peter joins John at the tomb. They walk in and it stinks. Muhammad is still there and by, by now the tomb was filled with the smell of his decaying body. For Jesus had risen, but Muhammad's just dead. Jesus' tomb is empty. Muhammad's tomb isn't. Because Muhammad is just dead, and no religion, no authority under heaven. Just Jesus' tomb is empty. Every other tomb people worship because there's somebody there. And that's the question I have for all the Muslims out there who are listening is, why is Muhammad still in his tomb? Why is it that you follow a man who's just dead when Jesus Christ is alive? If you say Muhammad is God, then Muhammad would be in heaven. He would be on the right hand on the throne of God, reigning intercession as our prophet or priest and our king. But Muhammad's just dead. Jesus Christ is alive. And, he's a, he, and Jesus Christ is our mediator this morning. And I just pray that we're in, it, we're in this for the long haul. We're not here just to simply get something out of it, to feel welcome. But we're here because we love the Lord. Great God and Heavenly Father, Lord, you are the eternal Son of God. Lord, the reason you're our, our, our priest is because you went in as a lamb to be slaughtered. You were laying upon the altar. Your blood was spilled and, and shed for the sins of of many. Lord, I pray that somebody today would have their sins remitted and I pray that they would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and be immersed for remission of sins to receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that now that we have a place that we can call home, Lord, and we know earth, or earth isn't really our home, but heaven is eternal and it, it's our home for everlasting life, God. And I just pray that now that we have a place to meet, that we don't have to have all the chaos of people swimming in a pool and disrupting our service, God. And I'm just thankful, God, that to have great, be surrounded by great men in the kingdom of God who love you, endure you, and, and may we emulate those great men that came before us, God, and, because they have a foundation on Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we can be uplifting today to one another and and that the message that John has is is full of joy and it's full of having us draw to repentance, God, because every message I've ever heard him preach just gave me that feeling through the Holy Spirit that man, I need to turn things around, God. And you're calling us to turn around, Lord, to not look back at the the ways of the world, but to press on as a as a farmer keeps to the plow, God, we have to press on and, and lay good soil and, and cast a seed upon, upon it, God. And We just love you and we want to worship you today and, and, and give you the glory for all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.